shower. <laughs> Okay, good morning. Good morning. Ah, uh, if you have your Bibles, open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. chapter 7. This week we're looking at, hi, good morning, we're, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're looking at practical considerations with regard to uh, victory over sin, just some practical considerations. Uh, and, and Well, not only that, but also dealing with people with addictions. Okay, so just to review, uh, we looked at... Uh, we, we looked at the 10 principles... Um, our used material puts it as uh, for overcoming stubborn habits, but basically had a victory over sin. Just to review, principle number one is, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it because I don't know if anybody wrote them down or I don't know if they would have it memorized by now, but like, okay, so principle one is, if God's against it, so am I. If God is against it, so am I. And then principle two, every sin has its origin in our hearts. Principle three. It's easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it has been defiled. Okay. Principle four. It is not possible to fight a fleshly appetite by indulging in it. Uh, principle five is small compromises lead to great disasters, otherwise known as little sins lead to big sins. Principle six. Those who do not love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord. Uh, principle seven, our sinful habits do hurt those that follow us. In principle eight, uh, it is not possible to fight a fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. And so it's similar to the other one that we have just read. Principle nine, we lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. Our consequences are inevitable and incalculable and up to God. And then principle ten is... God balances blame and guilt, or guilt with blame. Accept the blame for your actions, and God will remove the guilt. And we saw that was out of uh, 1 John 1 9. Okay, so uh, we kind of touched upon this a little bit last week. I just didn't get to finish it. And, but this is one of the. One of the uh, there's no particular order for how I'm stating these next ones, uh, what we're going to be dealing with today, but just, just some practical considerations that we're looking at. Okay, so today. Start off 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I, well, we'll start at verse 1 just to establish the context. You can, you can actually dump down to verse 8 where we were at last week, but uh, we have a little bit of time today. So, okay. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, receive us. We have wronged no man, we have uh, corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you, great is my glorifying of you. I am filled with comfort, I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Uh, for when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, uh, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those uh, that are cast down, comforted, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolations wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Now this is in reference to the fact that he had already written to them, and then they were coming again, and then he received notification from Titus about the fact that 
they were mournful over what he had to tell them about earlier. Uh, his other letter, and which was recorded for us, First Corinthians, about not just with the guy that was dealing with fornication or committing fornication with his father's wife, but also that you have uh, the division in the church because you have people that were all, you know, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, I'm of Cephas, and then you had also that they were taking the Lord's Supper properly. They were uh, mixed up about spiritual gifts and, and just all the different issues that he addressed with them uh, in First Corinthians. So now their attitude towards it was that they were mournful and they had, there was a change in them, they, they repented. Okay, and then that, that's what he's addressing here. Okay, for though I made you sorry, or the idea is sorrowful with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. Okay, um, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, or sorrowful, though it were but for a season. Um, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed uh, to repentance. For you were made sorry or sorrowful after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Okay, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then, for behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. All right, so we'll stop there. Uh, practical consideration number one is a person that is wanting help. Actually, in other words, if they have a genuine desire for help, they're going to be, uh, there's going to be a difference in their attitude towards their sin. They may not know how to get victory, but they may desire it, okay? And that's where we come in to help. If they're genuinely sincere as far as wanting help with it, then they're gonna have to approach their sin from this perspective. And here's what we see, and this is this is where re repentance, here, here's as far as God's, God's definition with regard to our sin, uh, uh, repentance should be, all right? Um, Again, context is he's writing to them, and then he hears from Titus that, hey, look, they're mournful, and then he writes to them again. Uh, in part, he's also trying to defend his apostleship, but in this particular part, this section here, with which he's writing to them, he's glad that they sorrowed to repentance, uh, and they didn't sorrow in a manner uh, after the world. And so he makes a distinction here. Okay, there's a godly sorrow, and then there's uh, worldly sorrow. And then godly sorrow, it says, worketh repentance to salvation, and then the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay, so here, here's the distinction. Okay, now salvation in this particular verse, in this context, is not speaking of not going to hell, but rather being rescued from something. That's literally what the word means, is to be rescued. So depending on the context in which it's used, it could be referencing being rescued or you know from going to hell or being rescued from from a great danger or from something so in particular here it's you're being rescued from being destroyed by your sin um just the, the, that's the way the context reads out with this and so and we know that also in romans we're told that uh the wages of sin is death so in other words the only thing the only product that sin produces is death which is literally a separation okay so it could, it could be your physical death or it could be just you know a broken relationship as such. Uh, so here's a distinction with a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. Um, godly sorrow acknowledges that there's hope, whereas worldly sorrow says there's there is no hope. Okay. So a person that's truly mournful of a godly sort recognizes that. Uh, here's what I was getting to, but I didn't get to finish last week. Is okay. There, there is hope. In other words, when I'm addressed about my sin. Uh, when I'm confronted about it, yeah, it's not pleasant, <laughs> okay, it's going to be painful, but the fact is I'm being addressed by it because there's hope. In other words, God wants me to change. He wants to do something about it. He wants me to do something about it. And so the thing is, um, if you think about it, okay, is God obligated to warn me, you know, before he destroys me? That, that, I mean, yes or no? Yeah, of course. He, he does um, like 
his own and corrects his own people. So I would. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah, in other words, it, no, he is, he's, a, he's not a person. He can do whatever he wants. He does so, he, in other words, he's merciful to he us. He would violate his character, though. That it is in his nature to be to, to, to be merciful and to reach out and to warn prior to bringing forth judgment. But he doesn't have to. But yeah, but he's, he doesn't right. have to. In other words, he, he if he wanted to, he could just say, hey, okay, done, boom, and then you're you're gone. You know. But or, I mean, it's, it's like saying, can God sin almost? <laughs> I guess my point with that the answer is, is that, no, because he sets the laws, but I yeah, mean, it's against his nature to violate his own nature. <laughs> That's true, that's a good point. <laughs> okay, God can wipe us out at any time. So he can deal with us according to our sins. He doesn't, because that's who he is as far as uh, he's merciful towards us. Go ahead. I, I would think that God would be working on you, and if you don't listen, if you don't listen, you don't listen, then that, that he might just... But I don't think he unknowingly to... You know, to us, he would just wipe us out if we're born again. Yeah. But like Judas wasn't born again. I don't think he warned him. Well, he would have. But, but his he, he would have daily been. teaching every day wasn't that a warning? Yeah, that's a warning. So he he's always warning in the word. Uh, my, my my point with that was is just simply that God can wipe us out at any time, but He does not. He's not willing that any should perish, but they'll also come to repentance. So he wants everybody to turn to him, to desire him, and to desire life. And he gives opportunity and space for that. Um, and so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, a person that recognizes that, that about God will want to deal with their sin accordingly. Uh, if, if you... Um, uh, in, in Proverbs, we're told about the, the, the wicked man that he, you know he that hardens his, his his neck, you know shall suddenly be destroyed and that without mercy. And you know uh, he's you'd be a fool. <laughs> I mean, but people do it every day though. Um, but the thing is, you you don't you don't have to go out like that. Um, but the worldly sorrow is one that views God in a twisted light, and they don't they either willingly are ignorant. Or and refuse to acknowledge his goodness and the fact that he look he's merciful to reaching out. He doesn't have to, but he wants to. Well, it, it, he he does because that's who he is. Uh, but they they would almost in a, spin him in the light of that, spin in his face, if you will, in the light of the fact that he is reaching out mercifully to us. That hey, you can turn, you can do something about it. And then you know they cry out, oh, no hope, no hope. You know that's why you got people that are uh, seemingly hopeless, helpless situation, and they go out and commit suicide, you know, because they think, okay, well, well, you know, I got no hope, when, you know, when the fact there is, and you can actually turn, regardless of whatever consequences you might experience and suffer, the fact is that's far better, and then throw your hands at pay, throw yourself in the hands of God, you know, at, at God's mercies, uh, than to just totally give up and give in, but he, uh, there's a distinction here, so godly sorrow recognizes, okay, the hope you know, found in God. And then here's how it is expressed. Uh, it says, um, it it works repentance to the salvation. Okay, in other words, it, you, you do something about your sin, so now you're rescued from being destroyed by it. Okay, and here's what it looks like. Um, verse 11. Okay, for this is something that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. What fear. Uh, vehement desire. Zeal and revenge. Okay? So, repentance with regard to your sin. If someone's genuine about it, um, this is what it's going to look like. This is their attitude and their mindset towards whatever the sin is. It's going to be, um, there's going to be a carefulness. In other words, they're circumspect. Now, they're not just haphazard about 
living or saying or letting whatever influence their life. Now they're particular that, you know, I can't do that. I got to stay away from this or I got to, you know, they have a total different disposition altogether with regard to, hey, it's wicked. Uh, I say the same thing about it that God says about it. Uh, so it, it brings about a carefulness in your life, a clearing of yourselves, okay? Clearing of yourselves. That would include restitution, uh, in other words, but you are looking to make right what's wrong. In other words, you, if you've wronged the person or people, you go to them. I've sinned against you. <laughs> How can I make this right? Now, you can't control their response towards you, but what you can do is you can cry out to God for the grace necessary to be able to do that. If they require you know, <coughs> payment, whatever the case may be, then you know, so be it. Uh, but the fact is you're willing to accept what it is. You, you'll, you'll seek a clearing, okay? Because I need to make this right. This isn't something I can just live with. I have a conscience now that is sensitized to this sin in particular and to just sin overall in general. Uh, and then not only the clearing, it says, yea, what indignation, okay? My sin is no longer fun to me. I mean, yet yeah, I still appeal to my flesh, but I'm going to adopt God's attitude towards me with regard to the fact that this is something that is it's evil. I can't, I, I can't deal with this. I, you know, I, I ought to have a, a, basically that hatred for it. Like, this is, this is something I'm going to allow. I'm not going to let it bring me down or affect others within my sphere of influence if I can as all. Uh, as much as much as it within me is, uh, and then uh, what fear? Okay, what fear? Uh, not just uh, like a, a being afraid, but also like a reverential awe. In other words, this is like, hey, this I need, I need God's grace, I need God's power. This is something not to be trifled with. Okay, uh, the fact is, sin's a lot more powerful than what I am. The devil's a lot more powerful than what I am. Uh, I don't have, you know, I need God's grace, God's strength. Uh, we, we saw that uh, last week in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, that was, I'm supposed to be strong in the Lord and the power of, of His might. It's not, it's not my own strength that I'm able to, to, to fight sin and, and, and all that. It's, it's in God's strength. Um, vehement desire. Vehement desire. Now, this is very similar because he's going to say zeal here, but vehement desire. So, in other words, I have a strong pull and urging. Uh, that says, look, I want to do right. I want to. It's kind of like, um, you realize you hurt God, it hurts Him, and that, that's yes. not what you want to do anymore. Yes, uh, that's actually a better illustration. I was thinking, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, I have, uh, To, to a degree, I'm kind of like this, but um, in Hawaii, that's where I was saved at, my home church there. I was 20 years old and I was living in the world, and you know, I didn't grow up really with much of a, much of any, I didn't have any kind of Bible knowledge whatsoever. Uh, and I certainly didn't really have much church exposure or anything like that. And then so, you know, I get saved. <laughs> the only thing I know is that everything that I was, you know, into and all that kind of stuff was really wicked. So I was like, man, this is, you know, I can't, I can't stand this. And I, I had, I'm not very like in your face, but I had a lot of friends that were, and, uh, and you know, so they go from being, um, well, literally, <laughs> they went from being like the, you know, the guy stumbling out of the the bar, kind of thing, right? To all of a sudden, that you know, they're, uh, they won't, you know, they're not touching it. They won't touch a, you know, which is good. I'm glad for that. You know, they won't touch a drop of alcohol or whatever. And then, you know, they're on the street corner street preaching now uh, to everybody. Um, and then, you know, they would, uh, I, <laughs> I have one friend of mine uh, that he, uh, not like, I think either within a few weeks or a few months of him getting saved, uh, he, he took his TV out into his yard and he's like, you lied to me all these years, and he just blew it up with a shotgun, you know? Because he's like, I'm not, you know? <laughs> uh, I was like, man, that's cool, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, because he was like, hey, I'm not gonna let this thing influence my life any more than what it already has and affected me. 
you know, I look wild like an animal kind of thing. And so this is one of the things that, you know, I got to get out of my life. And so that's what he did. Like, that's cool. Um, anyway, so you're going to have, you're gonna, that's going to be, you're going to be like, well, okay, hey, <laughs> you're going to seem radical. But you, yeah, because of the fact that like, hey, if I'm going to be close to God, I'm going to be right with God, maintain my, my relationship with God and keep right then, you know, I need to remove those things out of my life and then allow the things that are that are positive influence and, and so, you know, inundate my life with that. Um, and, and then the zeal, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a fire within you now. And it's like, okay, hey, this is, this is not only is, yeah, that's wicked, but and also you're seeking out the good. And then, yea, what revenge? What revenge? Okay, so now... Uh, you're going to be the guy, or at least you're going to have that within that, that fire in your bones that you're going to want to pull people from out of the fire. And what I mean by that is in the sense, okay, um, you see somebody involved in that sin, hey, man, that's wicked. Hey, you know, and you <laughs> it's almost like you're going to be drawn to want to pull them out as much as because, you know, how it affected you. Um, and so that's, this is, this is their, um, attitude their mindset and then here's Paul's estimation of this is in all these things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter now in that particular he was speaking of okay the, the here here's what you guys did in other words I, here's the testimony that I received from Titus of like what you guys have done and it's like wow that's amazing you know and you know you guys are you know, I <laughs> You know, obviously God's the one that looks on the heart. He knows the heart. But, you know, I'd be like, okay, hey, I, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you're not, you're not guilty anymore as far as with regard to, like, having a, a lax attitude towards the sin or sin in general and the things that I wrote you about. And so anyways, okay, practical consideration. This is going to be something that if a person wants help, needs help, they have to approach uh, their sin with regard to, you know, to, regarding this. In other words, they, they, this is their attitude, this is their disposition that they're going to have to take with regard to their sin. Uh, there, there's really no other way around it, you know. Um, practical consideration number two is not everybody that needs help wants it. Okay, not everybody that needs help wants it. Uh, but we should still make ourselves available, obviously, to help. Uh, uh, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse 4. Okay, for to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. Okay, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Okay, for a living dog uh, is better than a dead lion. Um, it, uh, <laughs> it seems like a strange verse, doesn't it? Like, okay, what's going on? So you have uh, Solomon writing a number of different things here, and then he particularly brings this out with regard to just having an outlook on life. Uh, now, mind you, his outlook for most of the book of Ecclesiastes is regarding life under the sun, in other words, apart from God, looking at life from a humanistic perspective without having God involved in it. Uh, but... He does bring up a point here. It says, okay, for him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Okay, so if you are alive, then you should be, one, thankful, but also, two, hopeful. In other words, 
you have something to look forward to. You have an expectation that's better than, you know, a dead man. And the reason why is because you're still alive. In other words, you still have breath. There's something that can still be done in your life, you know, and with your life. Uh, dead men don't have that opportunity. They're already past what they had, you know, is what they had. So the person that's alive still has hope to see something better happen, you know, to have better outcome. Uh, so if they're still alive, then they have hope. Okay, you have something to look forward to. Uh, we don't give up. And I, how does that relate? Okay, you don't give up on a person. I understand and I uh, realize, okay, not everybody can be helped. And there are periods or seasons within a person's life as far as the decisions that they make and the choices uh, that they choose as to whether or not you're in, you might be limited in, in your ability to be able to help them, but nevertheless, as far as your desire towards them should be, hey, look, I'm here, you can, you know, you can always come. Uh, and, you know, they ultimately have to make the choice as to whether or not they want to receive God's grace and, and receive help. Uh, but we don't just cast people away. Uh, the fact is, is because there's, if they're alive, there's still hope, there's still opportunity for them to be uh, born again, there's still opportunity for them to, to get victory. There's still opportunity for them to, to be turned around and be a vessel of honor that God can use. Um, you know, so God really honestly didn't, didn't throw us away. You know, um, so if there's hope, uh, it, one, obviously it's found in God, but also two, um, it's still available as long as a person has breath. The other thing that I wanted to look at was you have Christ cry out to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this is um, just prior to his passion, uh, but during the, the week of whenever he had presented himself prior to actual Passover, he cries out to them, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, thou that killest the prophets, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth? her chicks, you know, under her wing, but he, would, he not. would not, okay, so the fact is you have Christ calling out to the fact, uh, or to the fact, he, cry, he calls out to his people, uh, he came, you know, we're told in, in John, uh, he came unto his own, but his own received him not, now mind you, there are people that did receive him, and there were multitudes that came to Christ during his earthly ministry, uh, so it wasn't like he didn't have any impact or anything like that, uh, but the fact was, um, by and large, he was rejected, uh, and you know he was despised. Uh, you know we're told, uh, you know, man of good morning, sir. Uh, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Uh, but nevertheless, the thing is, uh, to well, obviously following, but to his eye moment, you know, he still anybody that would have believed on him, he would have received. So it wasn't like okay, he kicked anybody to the curb. Uh, he that cometh to him will no wise, he will no wise cast out. So Christ, um, again, didn't give up on people, so we should not. So practical consideration number two, obviously, not everybody is uh, willing to receive help, uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be willing to offer it, and again, don't give up on people. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we're looking over just some practical considerations. Uh, we just reviewed the 10 principles, and then we're just looking at some practical considerations on uh, just dealing with people, people with addictions and also just in helping people get victory. So the first one uh, that we had covered um, was out of 2 Corinthians 7, and that was our, the attitude of the disposition that a person has with regard to, you know, if they want help, if they truly are genuinely seeking help, then they're going to have a, a disposition that, ch I'm sorry, they're going to have a disposition that changes uh, with regard to their sin. Okay, and we saw that what that looks like out of Second Corinthians 7 as far as the, he gave a description of what repentance looks like. Uh, second one was basically, you don't, uh, what we just covered, we don't give up on people. And then uh, we, we kind of looked at this already last time. 
Uh, go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. And then we'll look at uh, Hebrews 10 as well. Hebrews 4, verse 15, okay, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And in verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then quickly over to chapter 10, chapter 10. chapter 10, uh, starting at verse 19. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, though, uh, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near... He's going he's to say three things. we got three commands here as a result of what we have in Christ. Okay, let us draw near uh, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies wash with pure water. So first command, draw near. Uh, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And then let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And here's how you do that. So now forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. All right. The church is our support network as believers. Uh, if you look, and I'm not sure how many, oh, I know you are, brother, but um, I'm not sure if anybody else here are familiar with any of the like AA or NA or, or any of those 12-step uh, type programs. Mm -hmm. um, at least with AA, uh, if I'm not, if, Correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, with regard to that, from what I've read and the people that I've talked to that were involved in those programs, I, have, I personally haven't been involved with them, but I have, uh, well, my brother was, and I, I have friends of mine that have been, uh, from the material that I've been able to see with regard to them, that they started out as like a Christian organization. They, were, they would have been power church, but they were started out as a Christian or organization. Uh, not much different than, I guess you could say, like Salvation Army and some of those others. That uh, you had a Christian leader, and then there was like a, it was more outreach oriented, uh, and then later on it would shift. Um, but if you look at any of those uh, type of programs, they have the similar structure as would church, and they follow the same kind of paradigm or pattern as church would. In that you have, um, okay, you get well, it's it's designed around sponsors, really, and that sponsor would be somebody that's more that they would be. I, quote unquote older in the faith I guess you can say they're already experienced they've already got victory so then what they do is they come alongside and they're the person that if you're struggling okay you call to and you, you reach out to and be like hey man I'm, I'm struggling I need help and then they talk you through uh, your struggle and that kind of thing and then they're, they're a support network okay um, and then you you know you're supposed to have a belief in a higher power to help you get through uh, your thing now initially it would have been they would have addressed God in the Bible but then they don't necessarily do that anymore uh, it's kind of open to whatever that would be for you, um, whatever would help you with regard to that. But, okay, so the church is, yes, sir. Well, I went to an NA meeting one time with, with a, a man that I was working with in the jail ministry, and there were about 10 people around the table smoking and cursing and, you know, I mean, taking the Lord's name in vain. It, it was not anything edifying. It was just a, a bunch of addicts getting together is what it amounted to. All right. Wow. Oh, wow. That's just one chapter, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What do they do to get people off the drugs? I know that's a little off the top of the Well, they, they did give some testimonials and things like that. But 
the people that I heard t give testimonials, they weren't really getting a victory over drugs either. They, in theory, okay, in theory this is what's supposed to happen, this is how it's supposed to work. They are support, moral support in a sense, so that when you're tempted, you don't give in. Uh, but you, they, I mean, like they don't actually give you like methadone if you're an NA or, or any kind of like step down drugs in case you're, you have an urge. They're basically there kind of as a, as a moral support to say, hey, look, don't do it, don't give in. Because uh, a lot of it, a lot of it stems around the, the old habits. Uh, a person goes get drunk or get high because, okay, they don't, probably, you know, they had a run home life or they're in some kind of environment. So they offer like an alternative environment so that you don't give in. Is basically what they're doing. Okay. Now, the church is different for a number of reasons. One, okay, you have Christ, you have the power of God available to you, so He can free you from that. Uh, he can take those urges away. Uh, but even then, when you have that temptation come in strong, okay, beyond just the fact, okay, we read in Hebrews four, we can come through the throne of grace. We want to point people to Christ. Ultimately, the church, though there is a social aspect to it, okay, there's a supernatural aspect. The fact is, is Christ's creation, okay, it's Christ's bride, it's God's idea, um, you know, that we even exist. Uh, you know, prior to Christ, you know, you know, telling Peter, hey, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, you know, they, they, you know, they were worshiping still Old, uh, Old Testament sacrificial system. And then Christ, you know, he comes along and He's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do a new thing. And then, you know, we read about that in Ephesians as far as the, the mystery that was before uh, hidden, but now is revealed. And then, you know, Christ, uh, Apostle Paul is given to, to go ahead and expound on that. Um, and others that, you know, through whom he revealed the mystery as well. Um, and then also that now he's going to take Israel and then the church and make of it one whole new body. Um, but it, that was God's idea. But um, so you, foundationally, okay, you have... It's Christ, so the person needs Christ. They're not born again, and that's really, really where they got to get the power. Uh, but church as a whole should be pointing people to God. Okay, I mean, there's obviously there's a social aspect. We need the fellowship, but we're pointing people to God. Uh, we're in, not just informing them, uh, but hopefully, by you know, by the grace of God, we're demonstrating through you know the grace experienced in our lives, as far as hey, look, this is what God can do with you, and even you know, we don't even know what He can do. Honestly, because we're limited a lot of times, uh, you know, I have not seen or you heard, you know, basically, yes. Yeah, like the AAA and all those other kind of help, you know, they do try to help you, but they're not dealing with sin. So God deals with our sin. Yeah. And those things are, Amen. so you can get rid of it. Yes. So, you know. in, he in Hebrews 10 here, he tells... Um, and he even gives a pattern here, okay, um, with regard to this. Okay, let's draw near, foundationally, before he even starts addressing uh, later on in verse uh, 25 about not forsaking assembling of ourselves. Uh, but he says, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, okay? Christ is made for us, you know, you know, redemption. He, he, he paid for our sin, but he also made a way... Um, here in context, he's addressing the Jewish believers that are looking towards old sacrificial system because they're like, well, man, it's too tough to live for God right now because we're getting persecuted. Uh, we're being ostracized not only just for being Jewish, but also by the Romans uh, uh, as well, and or by our own family as well as from the Romans and, um, and, and those kinds of things. So they figure, okay, if we go back to what we were going before, and then, so the, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is addressing him to say, hey, look, that's, that's weak and beggarly as he says it. You know, it's like, those are a picture of what is to come and Christ has already come. So Christ is the real deal. He's the fulfillment of these. So, you know, why would you go back to something that is lesser than? Christ is greater than grace. Christ is better than. And here's what he made for us. You couldn't even get to the holiest of holies to be able to access God's direct presence, but now you do have that. You know, and it's as if it's your own. You know, you belong there in the princes of God uh, because of what Christ has done. That He's, he's broken the, the not only just that middle wall partition, but he, he the the veil was rent between. Uh, we read about in, in Matthew, and then also 
I, you know, I, I, where else are you going to find direct access to the holiness of God, the presence of God, and have, you know, God manifest in us? So let's draw near, okay? We have access to it, take advantage of it, draw near, uh, and then um, hold fast the profession of our faith, okay? Um, in other words, uh, you know, the testimony that which you have, the, the reality of, of what we have, okay? You know, we have not just a home in heaven, but we have forgiveness of sin. Uh, we have new life in Christ. We have Holy Spirit living within us. We have all these great and precious what promises. Does that mean? Um, like hold steady. In other words, you you keep it's it's like an autumn term, uh, you, or you would be uh, <laughs> if you're moving, you know, keep you know keep 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 uh, um, yeah don't don't waver. In other words, keep keep okay. keep keep steady. Um, so you're, you're holding fast. In other words, it, I'm saved. God saved me. Jesus saves. That's true. That's never going to change. Okay? If I've trusted Christ, then yeah, I have that. Okay? And also the fact that, um, you know, Jesus saves. That's where salvation's found. You know, that doesn't change. He's, a, he was, he's able to save to the uttermost. Uh, so hold, hold fast to that. In other words, you know, that's, he can do for anybody what he's done for myself or for others. He's not limited in his power, his ability. And then he says here, you know, let's consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And this, and that's, this is how this is accomplished. Uh, one of the greatest means is by not forsaking the assembling ourselves, you know. And then he says, exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, God desired church to be that support network by which, you know, we receive the encouragement, the strength, and motivation and such for us to live for God to have the victory and such. Okay. No questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Good day. I was just going to ask if any adults were offered donuts. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Not yet. There's an addiction. Let me uh, I was just going to mention the one thing that's really mentioned, really missing in our you in the 10 principles is the 11th or 12th principle, whatever you want to call it. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're not going to sin. Good point. Good point. Okay. We're dismissed.